Valley fever survivors have been sounding the alarm on the dangers of the valley fever epidemic since 2002. In the past few days, the CDC has come out with an article describing their recent evaluation of valley fever. Since Valley Fever Survivor is an independent volunteer organization, we look at the research and connect the dots in ways that government agencies either can't or won't. We certainly like that they're making Valley Fever a fresh topic of discussion, but there are some details we wished the Centers for Disease Control had not left out of their report. Valley Fever Survivor will go into those details during this video. First, we will evaluate the early comment in this report that happens so often in other news and media. It's common in news reports in the medical literature to lead a story by claiming valley fever is usually self-limited and not a big deal, and then they give a hint of its seriousness. The problem is that most people tune out at influenza-like and do not pay attention to the rest. As a horrifying example, just days after the CDC report was released, a news story was done on valley fever in New Mexico. Shockingly, the reporter cited a Dr. John Iacone of Lovelace Health Plan who stated, Washing your hands is the best way to prevent valley fever. But nothing is further from the truth. Washing your hands will not stop you from inhaling the most virulent fungal parasite known to man. It is up to the CDC and all news media to lead their reports with the most important information, so falsehoods like this can never be accepted. As another example, reporters like to focus on risk groups like those with immune problems. But in reality, the ultimate risk group is anyone who breathes. 45% of a squad of Navy SEALs had been infected while training in Coalinga, California, and they are famously the strongest and healthiest among us. So much for risk factors. Further, it was estimated that there was an annual treatment cost of $120 million in 2001, a time with far fewer cases and far lower health care costs. It is as if the cost of completion for the vaccine and cure projects are thrown away every single year just on medical bills. It is information like this that would help people to understand the true depth of the problem. Also, while this report said less than 1% of cases developed dissemination to other organs, other doctors have given a far higher range that goes up to 7%. While this is the opinion of practicing physicians, major in-depth surveys have not been conducted for decades. This is incredibly important because of the increase in modern risk factors for valley fever, such as diabetes and immune conditions that make the dangerous spread to other organs more likely. In valley fever survivors' decade of correspondence and questionnaires, we have found that most patients had dissemination. This gives strong reason to question the low numbers in those estimates. Continuing further in the CDC report, it evaluated over 111,000 cases reported between 1998 and 2011. It noticed some of the usual issues, such as Arizona having 66% of the nation's reported cases and 30% going to California. On this handy chart, they also look back as far as 1998 to show that valley fever diagnoses are way up. If the chart listed the percentage increases, they could show it in even more serious terms. Valley fever caseloads are over 1,000% higher in Arizona, up about 800% in California, and over 200% higher in the handful of other states with decent reporting based on CDC numbers. If they went back earlier in Arizona's records to 1990, with only 280 reported cases, the difference between that and Arizona's 2011 caseload would show a COXI diagnosis increase of 5,784%. If there were greater surveillance over the entire nation, much less all the international travelers who pick up the disease and go home with it, the infection totals could be staggeringly high. Then, of course, valley fever was an ongoing epidemic since the Dust Bowl era, and endangered soldiers training in our air bases during World War II. A calculation of infection rates farther back into the historical records would make today's numbers look even more devastating. Ironically, during World War II, America held some captured Nazi prisoners in Florence, Arizona, and they subsequently fell ill after being infected with valley fever. Although the Nazi concentration camps were infamous for their torture and cruelty, Germany invoked the Geneva Convention so America would remove Nazi prisoners of war from the areas where valley fever could be contracted. American soldiers at these bases could be court-martialed for walking at parts of the base where they might more readily contract valley fever. 
Years later, the CIA felt Valley Fever had so much potential as a biological weapon that they broke the law to keep it. But when imprisoned Nazis were subjected to the risk of Valley Fever, it was considered an inhumane violation of their rights. When ordinary people like you and me are subjected to the risk of this disease, it's called a vacation or the place to make your home. And that's even while it was federally regulated as a biological weapon in two anti-terrorism laws. But I'll discuss that as we go further into the CDC report. This report considered why this ongoing increase in valley fever cases might have happened. Speculation included construction, climate, and reporting methodology. But the CDC had caveats about suggesting the role publicity and awareness among the community might have played. They noted that even when patients had valley fever symptoms, studies showed they were tested for it only 2 to 13 percent of the time. This makes reporting unreliable at best, and it matches valley fever survivors' experience after hearing from thousands of patients with valley fever. We completely agree with the CDC conclusion that there needs to be a greater awareness, but we might make one more suggestion to explain the ever-expanding size of the epidemic. As bad as it is that doctors test for valley fever as little as 2% of the time its symptoms show up, just maybe the epidemic is as bad as the CDC's other publications have said, and other doctors have said over the years. Going back to 1980, Dr. David Stevens' textbook, Coccidioidomycosis, estimated there were 10 million Americans infected with this disease. Yes, that is 10 million. And that is decades further back, before the epidemic and population both grew by orders of magnitude. To make this even more serious, the fungal parasite that causes valley fever was regulated for 16 years as a select agent of biological terrorism in two anti-terrorism laws. Then, in late 2012, it was dropped from the list, even though the reasons for its inclusion had never changed. It is still difficult to treat. It can be chronic or reactivate over time. It is still incurable. It causes major economic damage, and it is still an ongoing problem at our military installations. Further study of biological warfare also show it would provide plausible deniability for an attacker who would seek harm. Yet, inexplicably, all these reasons were ignored and it was removed from the regulated list. Many in the Valley Fever community felt violated that it was taken off the list as if the government itself decided to declare their suffering from valley fever wasn't a serious matter. This potential for reactivations and chronic suffering give doctors many opportunities to diagnose valley fever, even if they repeatedly fail to treat it properly at patients' first few visits. This could help bring the diagnosis rate way up. And even then we have heard from many patients whose doctors still refuse to test them for valley fever when asked, even in the worst endemic areas. If the current CDC report included information from a previous report in another CDC publication, that might also have put the problem of undiagnosed infections into perspective. That report created a statistical model to estimate that diagnosed cases represent only 2% of the total valley fever infections nationwide that happened at any given year. So for the CDC's current study to look at over 111,000 cases over five years, they need to realize 111,000 reported cases lead to an estimate of over 5.5 million total infections, in addition to the millions of infections from previous years. Then, as a real kicker, valley fever infection reporting was reduced and incomplete during 2010 due to bureaucratic problems. That guaranteed that a normal reporting level would have pushed the estimate even higher. If the millions of visitors to these areas were counted, whether they arrive from across the country or around the world, it would reveal the staggering toll valley fever takes. So while valley fever rages on, it's important to look at the whole picture. In spite of the report's focus on a handful of states, valley fever is not a local issue. It is a major national and international epidemic. We are glad the CDC is increasing its attention to valley fever, but there is always so much more to say about the epidemic and the people affected by it. To get the complete story on Valley Fever, go to valleyfeversurvivor.com, read our book Valley Fever Epidemic, and participate in our message boards, our Facebook page, and if you're looking for support, also join our Facebook Valley Fever Survivor support group. Together, we can bring the full story of Valley Fever to light.